Thank you uh, for invitation, Dr. Lu. This is a great pleasure to give a seminar. This is a very short trip. You know, actually, I was giving an uh, invited seminar to University of Georgia this uh, Tuesday. Actually, the, the, the Tuesday. And I have to spend a whole day just busy there. And then I have to spend a whole day to return. But this is only like 10 minute trip to the, the place. So this is a really great seminar. I feel very happy. <laughs> So today I'm going to talk about metabolic engineering. Actually, the, maybe some of you are very familiar with metabolic engineering and some of them are not. So I'll try to explain what is metabolic engineering and then I'm going to talk about a couple of examples of using metabolic engineering for producing value-added chemicals and fuels. So why we do this metabolic engineering or fermentation? Because we can do uh, value-added biotransformation. So using microbial cell, we can convert sugars into other value-added product. Actually, this process or this practice is very popular in food science. So probably you heard about you know, making uh, kimchi, which is uh, actually the lactic acid fermentation, or making wine is a uh, yeast fermentation or making vinegar, which is acetic acid fermentation. And also we can produce a uh, food ingredient. Probably you heard about xylitol, which is a reduced alcohol of xylose. We can use as a sugar substitute. You know, when you buy a gum or candy, they have xylitol, then it you know, reduces the decay of tooth. So it's a functional food ingredient. And we also we can produce amino acid. Probably you heard about monosodium glutamate. Right, which is uh, uh, amino acid, but we use as a flavor enhancer. We, you know, produce uh, amino acid using microorganism, and also we produce biomass, a yeast cell. Probably, if you bake home, you know how to make the bread. You add water to the flour, and then you add a little bit of sugar, and then you add yeast. Right. So we produce uh, this uh, yeast by fermentation. So this is very a uh, popular process in food science. However, there are some limitations for uh, using this process for other purposes. For instance, you know, we can produce uh, lactic acid or ethanol, but let's say if I want to produce uh, uh, aspartame. You know, what is aspartame? Which is an uh, artificial uh, sweetener. But if we look at the structure of the aspartame, it has aspartate and penylalanin. So in order to do so, we need to overproduce aspartate and penylalanin. There is no microorganism which overproduce aspartate or penylalanine as it is. We need to do some engineering, or we need to introduce mutation, or we need to do a genetic engineering to overproduce uh, those components. And also, if we want to overproduce some uh, new uh, pharmaceutical uh, drug, and usually the microbial cell would not make that pharmaceutical drug as it is. Then we need to do some metabolic engineering, or we need to do some genetic manipulation to change the property of the cell. So in a nutshell, metabolic engineering is a gene therapy of a microbial cell. You know, we do a gene therapy to change the, the, the health state of human, right? Same thing, we, do, we add the genetic material to the microbial cell to change the behavior of the microbial cell. So we can do uh, more than this food fermentation. So these are the, uh, the example. These are the traditional food fermentation example. But if you go to the market, now we see more and more uh, of the product which is made by microbial fermentation. And these are not uh, food anymore. So these are the food ingredient or nutraceutical or the, the drug. And among those examples, these are the, this is a lysine and coenzyme Q10. And in addition to this uh, ingredient and biofuel is uh, one big field of uh, uh, field that can be uh, improved by metabolic engineering. So today I'm going to talk about two examples. Sorry. So first example is uh, uh, making cellulosic ethanol. And the other example is to produce human milk oligosaccharide. So I will uh, tell you why we want to produce human milk oligosaccharide in detail a little bit later. So in order to do so, we need to use microbial cell. 
So this is a, a chemical conversion. So I intentionally show the chemical structure of uh, uh, cellobios and xylose or lactose here. But after doing this fermentation, we have a totally different chemical structure. And then this is just another one step reduction or oxidation. This is a very complex series of the reaction. So as you see, we have this very complex structure, but now we have this one homogeneous molecule through this process. Same thing, we have a very uh, complex sugar attached to the sugar to the specific location. It's very difficult to control by the enzymatic reaction, but if we use a whole cell, which is programmed, by our genetic manipulation, we can do this fermentation or this conversion in you know, one step. How do we do that? So we use metabolic engineering, which is a rational and strategic approach for strain improvement. I'm going to show you a very simple example here. So let's say we have a wild type cell. You know, we have yeast cell or E. coli cell do uh, some bioconversion. And it produces the metabolite X and Y. Somehow it produces two types of metabolite. And we found that Y is very, very useful or very expensive, like 1,000 times more expensive than X. Then in this case, this is pretty good fermentation, but our kind of intention is to eliminate the production of X. Can we make just Y? Because Y is more useful and expensive. Then with that intention, you may want to look at the metabolic pattern. So we have this metabolic pattern. Let's say we have that, we know that. Then by looking at this metabolic pattern, you can immediately uh, think about a new idea. Okay, let's overexpress enzyme E3. Then we may be able to uh, shunt more carbon to this pathway and we may get more uh, metabolite Y. So we can do that by genetic manipulation. However, most of the time if we do that, Actually, this is the outcome. You know, we have a little bit of improvement of metabolite Y production, but it's not drastic because uh, so unexpected uh, the amplification of this flux. So always uh, metabolic engineering is very difficult because uh, you know in the, the green street you know, uh, we want to increase the flow of the car in the green street, and we uh, build up or we uh, make a better uh, kind of the flow, the, the, the load condition for the green street. But sometimes the cell car don't, don't come to the green street. You know, for some reason, cell just come to the Springfield. You know, so it's very difficult. You know, although we have an idea how to control this, but cell has uh, uh, even higher capability where they don't respond to our expectation. So always, uh, this is uh, not a one step perturbation, we should do uh, iterative uh, engineering. So in this case, we overexpress E3 first, and then we look at the flux. So that's uh, the key. About 20 or 30 years ago, we had this idea, but we were not able to practice this idea because at the time, we didn't have a tool to look at the flux. But now we have a genomics and systems biology approach. We can measure the transcript very accurately, all the gene. We can measure the amount of the metabolite. So we have a, a good idea how it, I mean, here I was drawing this, but about 10 years ago, it was just, you know, black circle. But now we have an idea because of this uh, analytical tool. And then after doing this perturbation, we found this unexpected flux increase, and then, okay, let's delete this reaction. Then maybe next, next round, maybe the metabolite the Y would do production would increase, or another unknown reaction will happen and then steal the Y at the same level. Then we should do delete this reaction again. So this is uh, iterative engineering. So sometimes you know, we call this metabolic engineering, now it is evolved as uh, a systems metabolic engineering, because in order to do so, you need to look at the, the everything at the system level. So the first example with this uh, idea, first example I'd like to introduce is uh, simultaneous co-fermentation of mixed sugar for producing fuels and chemical. So probably you heard of a corn ethanol. So this is a very simple process. We harvest cornstarch and use the enzyme to, uh, monomer to generate monomeric glucose and we do yeast fermentation. We produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. So this is uh, heavily uh, practiced in the United States. We have uh, more than 200 corn ethanol plants. So we are making uh, ethanol a lot from corn. 
to tell the truth, more than 40% of the corn, which is produced in this country, are converted into ethanol. So, it's so good and bad, because we replace uh, gasoline. You know, if you go to the gas station, about 10% of your gas, gasoline, is actually ethanol. So we use this as a, a petroleum uh, or gasoline uh, replacement. That's a good point. However, the bad point is uh, still in this world, there are many people who are starved without, uh, because of uh, lack of food. So making fuel from food is uh, unethical. So that's why there is uh, like some ethical issue, right? So that's why we want to, and also another thing is uh, the corn is not sustainable. You know, people were thinking about making ethanol from corn was a great idea, but if we look at very carefully, the, the story is not that great. Because in order to cultivate corn, we need to use fertilizer. We need to use uh, irrigation. So these are all energy consuming. So in order to produce uh, ethanol from corn, you need to consume a lot of gasoline. So this is like, in terms of energy balance, although still we have some positive, but we need to use a lot of energy input to produce corn ethanol. So ethical issue and also energy issue, the like an energy balance issue, and also another issue is uh, the sustainability issue. You know, although we, I mean, this state is a pretty good state to grow the corn, Illinois is corn, right? But Alaska, they cannot grow the corn, right? So, so, this corn ethanol is uh, kind of temporary. It's not sustainable for everybody, especially in the United States. But think about a uh, country like uh, Korea or Japan or UK. They don't have enough land to cultivate corn. So this is not good. So that's why people thought about producing cellulosic ethanol. Probably you heard about cellulosic ethanol as a second generation. So instead of using edible part, edible part of uh, a plant, so this is a, a corn, we are using only the, the grain. But instead of using those grain, let's use the whole body of a plant. Then we don't have to use only corn. Any switchgrass, any grass, any wood material, we could use. Because uh, that cellulosic material, if we hydrolyze, we get sugar. Same. Even this, uh, I don't know if it is made by wood, if we hydrolyze this, we will be able to get the sugar. Then, we don't have to worry about this ethical issue and also the generation of plant material from photosynthesis is sustainable. And some of the, uh, the, the crop, we don't have to provide fertilizer or we don't have to provide uh, uh, irrigation. So those are what we call energy crop. And if you have a chance to travel to south part of the, our campus, we have energy farm which is made by EBI, and if you go there, you will see like three or four meter tall of uh, the grass. Like probably heard about Miscanthus giganteus, which is a big tall grass, can be grown into that big with the minimum management, which is a pretty good source for making sugar. So the idea is to use the cellulosic sugar a cellulose biomass to produce sugar and then do the fermentation. So basically the bottom part are same. But there are a couple of problems. In order to do so, we need to extract the sugar or isolate the sugar from cellulose biomass. Think about this. Very difficult to, I mean, even though you leak, you cannot taste the, the sweet, right? Because by the design, you know, think about the plant. They have a stalk or they have this uh, uh, very strong part. That's for their uh, physical uh, stand, right? And then the seed, like uh, apple or the grain, is uh, for the next generation. That's why it has a sugar. So this uh, uh, physical part, or, or this, uh, the non-edible part, has lignin, which is a kind of a supporting uh, material. Uh, then it, lignin uh, protects the sugar. And then if uh, this uh, sugar can be used by this uh, material easily, they cannot sustain. You know, wood should stay, or well, tree should stay like 20 years, even 100 years. If the sugar is accessible and by, you know, easily, then the wood decay immediately because in the world we have so many microorganisms. Even in my hand, they are looking for sugar to grow. So it would decay. However, wood material has lignin. 
So we cannot, you know, we, it's very difficult to hydrolyze uh, the wood material into the sugar. So we need to use a very sophisticated pretreatment. Probably you heard about like, you know, high temperature, high pressure, or acidic or alkali condition to speed up this uh, uh, degradation. Even after that, we have a glucose and xylose mixture. So in case of starch or sugarcane fermentation, we only get hexose, which is uh, only glucose or fructose, can be easily fermented by yeast. But in case of cellulosic biomass, we get xylose, which is very difficult to ferment. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And also we get acetate, which is very toxic to the cell. So if we hydrolyze cellulosic material, we get glucose, xylose, and acetate which is totally different from cornstarch, just glucose, so easy to ferment. But now we have very you know, recalcitrant and toxic uh, sugar, which and also this acetate fermentation inhibitor killed the, the yeast, so which is even worse. So this is the problem. So that's why, although we are talking about cellulosic uh, ethanol for more than a decade, Frankly speaking, there is no cellulosic ethanol plant in the United States as of now. It's only at the laboratory level. Nobody was able to commercialize cellulosic ethanol plant in this country. Although we spend billions of money for studying this problem. So, having said that, I'd like to talk about the strain. You know, we are using Saccharomyces cerevisiae for this fermentation. So this is the strain we use for making beer and wine. It's a very good strain to produce ethanol from glucose. And also, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae was a model strain for eukaryotic biology. So whoever studied eukaryotic molecular biology used Saccharomyces cerevisiae as a kind of model system. So that's why we have a very good uh, genetic and genomics tool. So we have overexpression and knockout tool. So very easy to manipulate the gene. And also we have a, a successful example of expressing heterogose enzyme in this strain. So there's no experimental bottleneck to manipulate the genome or gene in this strain. However, this strain cannot use xylose. I told you that if we hydrolyze cellulose material, we get glucose and xylose mixture. But the problem is this strain cannot use xylose. So this is the problem. And we want to solve this problem by metabolic engineering. So fortunately, there is a strain. There is a yeast strain which ferments xylose. And we found that the, there is a xylose metabolic pathway. But Saccharomyces cerevisiae do not have that xylose metabolic pathway. So the basic idea is to clone those three enzymes and introduce into Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Then our engineered strain should be able to ferment xylose. However, it's very simple, it looks very simple. However, it is more complicated than what we expected. And I sp spent about 10 years to engineer this pathway. And then initially we thought just introduction is uh, enough for uh, fermenting xylose. However, at the end of the day, we realized that we need to optimize the expression level of this uh, enzyme in order to have uh, efficient uh, uh, xylose fermentation. In addition, we found that also, we need to use uh, some spontaneous mutation to speed up the xylose fermentation. So one e uh, idea is uh, what we call laboratory, uh, excuse me, what we call laboratory evolution. After we generating xylose fermenting strain, and we culture the strain, the resulting strain in the xylose condition over and over. Then we found that strains are using uh, xylose a little bit faster and faster and faster if we continue this uh, uh, culture. So we uh, repeated this culture more than 20 times. And then we isolated a single colony. And then we evaluate each single colony. And we found uh, one, of the single col one of the colony ferments uh, xylose much better than others. So although I cannot disclose the, the mutation, we did the genome sequencing to find out what other uh, the mutation caused rapid xylose fermentation. And we identified the mutation. We know the, the, the story. I cannot disclose that right now, but we found that. And we uh, found, actually, even I can tell because the paper has been uh, published uh, about two weeks ago. And we found the mutation, which is a mutation in a, a phosphatase gene. 
And uh, if we have a specific mutation, you know, a sugar phosphatase, we certainly, we, we amazingly have a uh, better jalous fermentation. So this is the result. So this is the engineered Saccharomyces BCI, and this is uh, the naturally existing jalous fermenting strain. As you see now, our engineered strain consumes jalous very well and produce ethanol almost uh, as fast as uh, this naturally existing system. So now we have engineered strain which ferment xylos as well as uh, the naturally existing strain. Then maybe you ask a question, and why don't we just use uh, this uh, uh, Sheparomyces stipitis for making ethanol? But this strain has uh, very low ethanol tolerance. So up to like 3 or 4% ethanol, they make very well. However, they cannot produce up to 10%. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the strain we are using for wine generation, wine making, they can produce uh, ethanol up to 14%. So if you look at the ethanol concentration in the beer and wine, the beer has about 5% ethanol, and wine has about 14 to 15% ethanol. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae will produce uh, high ethanol, the high ethanol at the, of the high concentration. Can you also evolve like the left stream to increasing their ethanol tolerance? Yeah, definitely that's possible. However, so that, that, that's a very interesting approach, but the reason why we do metabolic engineering is we want to create an uh, engineered biological system with uh, comprehensive understanding. Because, for instance, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisia, we have uh, almost, uh, we know everything about like a stress, stress response, we know all the important protein and DNA interaction. We know those. But the problem of PKCPTS or the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we don't have that information. So definitely, we may be able to evolve this strain a little bit, but it's very difficult to study because it's not well characterized. So we had this Jalos uh, fermentation strain, but still there is a problem. So after making this jalous fermenting strain, we tried to use glucose and jalous mixture from cellulose hydrolysate, and then we found uh, uh, there is a problem which is called catabolite repression. So this is happened to everybody or any living system. If you provide two substrate or two sugar to a living system, the living system, you know, it's a bacteria or cell or animal, whatever, will use preferred sugar first. And then until the free food sugar is gone, they would not touch the second sugar. This is like if I give uh, ice cream and broccoli to my son. My son would not touch broccoli until he, you know, eat the, the ice cream. Always, E. coli or yeast, whatever. If you provide glucose and lactose to the E. coli, E. coli will use glucose first, and only when glucose is gone, they will touch lactose. So this is a very well-known problem. So that's why if we mix glucose and xylose, because glucose represents xylose metabolism, we have this type of uh, sequential fermentation. That means glucose will be used first. During that time, xylose cannot be fermented at all. And then xylose will be fermented later. And also another problem is like, you know, the rate of eating chocolate or ice cream by my son, and the rate of eating the broccoli, if you think about it, my son will, you know, sucks, you know, the ice cream imme immediately, but broccoli takes a time. Same thing, the pre sugar fermentation is very fast. But the second, you know, sugar utilization will be very, very slow. So this is the problem. So we wanted to solve this problem. And actually, this is the actual experiment data. We got it. So this is the data from the Purdue University. They also generated a similar strain, and they did glucose and jalous co-fermentation, and they found that there is a like two-phase fermentation, like you know, glucose fermenting period and jalous fermenting period. And glucose fermenting period is very short, but jalous fermenting period is very long. So this is a big problem for commercialization. Because uh, if we do this fermentation for making ethanol, so let's just say we have this strain, we have this process in the, the plant. And if you look at the time, it takes about 60 hours, right? Then it takes uh, like a two and a half day, or let's say three days. So total fermentation is three days. And we uh, build a big bioreactor, and then we do this fermentation. Then the maximum number of fermentation you can do in a year is about 120 because each fermentation takes three days. So 
the, you, only, you can do only uh, 120 times of fermentation a day. But again, after you finish the fermentation, you clean the reactor, you sterilize. So that's why the number of fermentation even reduced to uh, 60 or 70, something like that. So the fermentation time is very important. Let's just say if we reduce this fermentation time to the 20 hour, that means you can do 360 fermentation per year. Right? The same fermentation facility, like uh, the A facility using this strain, or the maximum the throughput is only uh, 70 fermentation a year. But another competitor has the same fermenter, but efficient strain, which ferment, uh, finish the fermentation 24 hours, can do more than 200 fermentation. Right? Then this is a big money making. So that's why the fermentation time is very, very important. We really like to finish this fermentation within 24 hours then we uh, can uh, produce ethanol a uh, more uh, economically viable way. However, the, in reality, we have this very good glucose fermentation and very slow gelos fermentation. So in order to solve this problem, we thought about you know, co-fermentation. Instead of uh, uh, using glucose and gelos uh, separately, let's uh, do a multitasking. Let's uh, ask the cell to use glucose and gelos at the same time. It's very difficult. Cell would not ferment glucose and gelose at the same time. So we made a trick. Because uh, we are not making glucose, we're getting glucose from polymeric form of the sugar. In order to generate the glucose, we need to hydrolyze glucose polymer into glucose. And the intermediate form is the cellobios, which is a dimeric sugar in between the, the hydrolytic reaction. Actually, we can stop the reaction here. Instead of making glucose, we can produce cellobios. Then we don't have to add beta glucosidase. So we uh, add less enzyme and we produce intermediate. And then what we found was if we have this intermediate instead of glucose, intermediate, the cellobios would not repress xylose fermentation. So the previous uh, the diagram, as you see, glucose inhibit the xylose fermentation. That's why we get this uh, uh, glucose and xylose uh, uh, sequential fermentation. But if we hijack cellobios, cellobios and xylose can be co-consumed. So that, that's the idea. And if we do that, we can uh, reduce the enzyme cost because we don't have to add the beta glucose days. And also, as you see here, since the two sugars can be co-consumed, we can finish the fermentation earlier. And also, we can even uh, implement a continuous process. And also, by using this idea, we can also produce uh, the chemical very rapidly. I'm going to show you a couple of examples today. In order to do so, we need a cellulose transporter and efficient jalous fermentation. This, this is uh, our topic. We are studying uh, jalous fermentation more than 10 years. And then at the time, you know, I was very lucky to have a collaboration with uh, uh, Jamie Kate at UC Berkeley. They published a paper in Science in 2010. They found the uh, cellulose transporter and the intracellular beta glucose days. And they said, you know, we can do cellulose fermentation. And I immediately thought, oh, maybe it would be possible to combine these two uh, research in order to do uh, cellulose and jalous co-fermentation. So we uh, made a strain which has a cellulose pathway and jalous pathway at the same time. And we did a fermentation. So this is uh, the initial experimental result. We uh, added 20 gram per liter of cellulose and 20 gram per liter of jalous. And two sugar can be co-consumed. And we even increased the, the concentration, also co-consumed. And even 40 and 40 can be co-consumed. So regardless of the sugar amount, you know, cell consume cellulose and jalous at the same time. So if I uh, emphasize the impact of this fermentation again by this graph. So we have a uh, uh, fermentation with 40 gram per liter. It takes uh, 48 hours. And cellulose fermentation takes uh, another 48 hours. But if we mix those two, still we can finish the fermentation at the 48 hours. So this is like one part fermentation for two fermentation. So this is a big uh, commercial uh, impact. Now we don't have to do a two fermentation. We just do one fermentation, but still we get the same amount of ethanol. We can process the same amount of sugar. 
And in reality, we don't have a 40 and 40 gram per liter. In reality, we have uh, uh, 80 gram per liter of cellular bias. If we hydrolyze uh, the energy cane, and we get the sugar concentration like this, 80 gram per liter of cellular bias, 40 gram per liter of xylose, and about 10 gram per liter of glucose. And we found that still our strain was able to co-consume these sugars and produce ethanol very efficiently. This is the naturally existing strain, the Saccharomyces stipitis. Although it ferments cellulose and xylose, as you see, very poor. Now this uh, uh, engineered biological system performs better than naturally existing system. And still the fermentation takes 48 hours. I told you that I really like to finish this within 24 hours. So we use the uh, engineered uh, industrial strain. Usually the laboratory strain and industrial strain has a different performance, and we found that industrial strain performed better. And after introducing cellulose and xylose uh, metabolic pathway into industrial strain, we are able to finish the fermentation within 24 hours. So now we are satisfying the, the, the goal. Like you know, when they started this business, they said uh, the, 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 the productivity should be uh, more than two gram per liter per hour, and then our strain was able to produce ethanol at the level. So I was very excited, and then BP uh, was very excited about this approach. So they wanted to uh, build uh, the big uh, commercial plant using these ideas. I'm not sure they used this idea, but anyway, they were uh, planning to uh, uh, the, do a, the, the building a big plant in Florida. And, but suddenly, last year, November, they canceled the plant. So everybody was thinking, oh, we may be able to see cellulosic ethanol in the United States within a couple of years, but BP canceled the plant, so we need to wait another couple of years. Why did they cancel it? So a couple of things. So they tell, you know, we had uh, some discussion. They said, technology is OK. We have a technology. However, the kind of uh, economic environment, because in order to do so, they need to invest. $500 million. And then right now, BP think they can do better uh, if they use the $500 million for other purpose. So they want to wait. So, so this is a co-fermentation idea. And also, uh, I, when I was in Korea, I was uh, doing similar study. But in Korea, they had a different idea because there is no biomass or energy crop in Korea. But they have a lot of this seaweed. So they were thinking about, let's use seaweed as a substrate, as a starting material, and let's produce ethanol. Because seaweed grow very well. It's very easy to mass produce. And also, the biggest thing is uh, seaweed do not have lignin. You know, if you know the shape of the seaweed, it's very flexible. So they don't have lignin. It's very easy to hydrolyze or depolymerize. And also, the, well, why we do this? Because we want to reduce the carbon dioxide for the production in the air. You know, we are thinking about global climate change because by using more and more petroleum, we produce more and more CO2 gas and then cause a big impact. So if we do that, see, we do capture the CO2 better than terrestrial biomass. So this is a great idea. However, if we hydrolyze seaweed, we get a mixture of glucose and galactose. And galactose fermentation is also a very good example for uh, regulation. You know, if glucose is present, yeast would not touch galactose. You know, it's a transcriptional, translational, allosteric, very complex regulation. This is one of the, the, the big topic for the systems biology studies. This is a seminar paper by Trey Decker. They study like the gene expression level or protein content and flux uh, in the, the galactose fermentation. It's very complex. So if glucose is present, galactose cannot be used. So same situation. So we wanted to bypass this by cellulose and galactose fermentation. Because uh, seaweed has cellulose and galactose, or galactan. So if we uh, stop the hydrolysis reaction at the level of cellobios, cellobios and galactose can be co-consumed. So we made a strain, and then we found that cellobios and uh, galactose can be co-consumed, as we saw in the uh, xylose and cellobios mixture. And this is a comparison. If we use uh, 
glucose and galactose mixture, sorry, the glucose and galactose mixture, glucose can be consumed very rapidly and galactose consumption will follow very slowly. But if we use our engineered strain, we can consume galactose and cellulose at the same time. So this co-fermentation is very uh, promising for uh, using uh, other sugar mixtures. And also, because we have this uh, uh, co-fermenting capability, so this is like a, a multitasking capability. I don't know, you know when you begin to use uh, a computer, but maybe you know, when I was uh, learning you know, how to use a computer, personal computer, we had uh, uh, Windows 3.1. I'm talking about very primitive operating software, the system. Like, you may know like Windows 95. Before the Windows 95, we had Windows 3.0. At the time, everybody was so crazy because we can do multitasking. Like when we were using MS-DOS, it was like command line, just one thing. You know, if you do something, you cannot do other. But when we had Windows 3.0, we had uh, two windows running two, you know, those uh, command line. It's so cool. So same thing. You know, now we can use two sugar at the same time. So we can do many things. So one of the kind of idea was to use this concept for making a xylitol. And xylitol is a, a very popular sugar uh, substitute in Asian country. At the same time, xylitol is a very promising chemical for making other building blocks. Once we make a xylitol using a simple chemical conver conversion step, we can produce other important chemical. Uh, chemical can be used for industrial process. So this is the current process. So we use the glucose and xylose mixture. And then we convert the xylose into xylitol. But we have a problem. Glucose inhibits xylose transport. So in order to solve this problem, we need to uh, add glucose very slowly. So one way is they add xylose, xylose and then they feed the glucose a little bit, and then wait until glucose is gone. Then xylose will be converted into xylitol. And then they will add the glucose a little bit. Because if they add glucose a lot, cell would not convert the xylose into xylitol. They just use glucose. You know, if you want to do something with the broccoli, you need to feed the ice cream a little bit, little bit. Otherwise, uh, my, if I give uh, a lot of ice cream, my, my son would not touch broccoli at all. So that's the kind of trick. But we don't have to do that because uh, if we use the cellobios and xylose, we can feed the cellobios and xylose, and then cell will use two sugar at the same time. So the idea was to use the cellobios and xylose mixture to produce xylitol. And then we did a fermentation experiment after constructing the strain. I mean, since it is uh, I mean, not a biology, I mean, this is because you guys are all engineers, I skip all the details of strain construction. But in a nutshell, we uh, engineer the strain for converting uh, xylose into xylitol and then with the cellulose consumption. And then we did the fermentation. This is a comparison with glucose and xylose. As you see, glucose will be consumed very fast, and xylose will be used very slowly. But if we feed the cellulose and xylose, so we use the xylose and cellulose at the same time, it will produce the xylitol very well. So at the 20, 48 hour, the, the, the previous system only produced 13 gram per liter of xylitol, but we were able to make uh, almost 19 gram per liter of xylitol. And one more example is that we are doing this in a bioreactor. In case of glucose and xylose mixture, you know, when glucose is consumed, cell cannot convert the xylose into xylitol. But our case, we are consuming cellobios, uh, the, the, the xylose from the initial point, and then this is the rate of the xylose, uh, xylitol uh, production. Well, if we use the cellobios and xylose mixture, we have a much higher rate of xylitol production. In addition, we also wanted to further improve this process because in order to produce the xylitol, we need a NADPH as a reducing power. Mm -hmm. So because the xylose to xylitol is a reduction. So something should be oxidized. So NADPH is a cofactor. In order to overproduce NADPH, we overexpress three enzymes. So which is a GWF, which is a, also one of the enzymes produce NADPH or ALD6 and also IDP2. So in order to produce more NADPH, we overexpress this enzyme and we look at the effect of this enzyme for xylitol production and we found that IDP2 has the highest impact. 
but still, you know, all the overexpression has a better, uh, resulted in a better xylitol production. However, if we do the same thing with glucose and xylitol mixture, we cannot see that effect. Although we have higher NADPH production, glucose uptake, uh, so, sorry, xylitol uptake will be limited by glucose. So we cannot see the impact in case of glucose and xylitol mixture, but with the cellulose and xylitol mixture, we see the uh, impact very well. So using this co-fermentation and overexpression of enzyme for making NADPH, we are able to produce xylitol much faster and efficient than the existing process using this idea. So the basic idea is like this is a conventional uh, fermentation process. We use glucose or sucrose and we produce uh, fuels and chemicals. But now we extend the substrate using cellulosic hydrolysate in addition, we can use multiple sugar at the same time. So can we, we can use uh, cellulose and xylose mixture at the same time, sucrose and xylose at the same time, or cellulose and galactose. So by using cheaper or non-edible substrate, even we can do better because we have a simultaneous co-fermentation of mixed sugar. That's the one idea, and then maybe I can spend another five minutes to explain another very in interesting example of metabolic engineering. So, so next thing is the uh, production of 2FL. Probably it's very, uh, you are not familiar with the sugar. So this is uh, uh, oligosaccharide. And why we want to produce 2FL? The, all the idea came from the, the breast milk-fed baby and formula milk-fed baby. For some reason, the baby had breast milk, so healthier, uh, or I mean, they are stronger than the, the formula-fed milk, formula milk fed baby, right? Then they found that somehow breast, uh, the, the, the milk-fed baby has higher contents of bifidobacterium in their gut. The formula-fed baby has lower bifidobacterium, so maybe gut you know, microorganism do something. And then they wanted to look at what is the difference between cow's milk and human's milk. And they found that human milk has very unique oligosaccharide. This is what we call human milk oligosaccharide. And most of them has a few course unit. Probably you don't know what is a few course. A few course is a five carbon sugar. It's a rare sugar, but human milk has uh, oligosaccharide, the fucosyl lactose. So this is a lactose unit, which is also very abundant in cow's milk. But human milk has uh, fucosyl lactose. So now they uh, suspect that maybe this fucosyl lactose, when we had the milk, caused the growth of the bifidobacterium or good bacteria. That's why we get healthier. So that's a hypothesis. So. The reason why I wanted to study was because I'm in food science department and uh, my colleague wanted to study this. And he said, oh, Dr. Jin, I like to study the effect of uh, 2FL adding to the, the food. So he wanted to design, he designed the experiment, like he has two pig, piglet model. So he wanted to feed uh, the normal diet, he wanted to feed the uh, 2FL in each diet, and he wanted to look at uh, the, the changes of gut microorganism in the, the pig system. In order to do so, he need to feed the 2FL. And he checked the price of this sugar is like $100 per milligram. In order to feed the piglet, he need to have uh, several grams or even 100 grams of sugar. Then it cost him like a million dollars just to buy sugar. And I thought, maybe we can do something. So uh, I checked you know, the current scheme and then they do uh, 2FL isolation from human milk, which is possible, but it's not a good way. And also some chemical synthesis, and I found there is enzymatic uh, uh, synthesis of uh, 2FL synthesis. So, in a nutshell, so there is a 2FL producing pathway in E. coli. By engineering this 2FL pathway, we can produce this sugar in E. coli. So we engineered a GDP glucose pathway, and then in order to uh, attach this GDP glucose into lactose, we overexpress the glucose transferase from Helicobacter pylori. So we made a strain, which produced 2FL. Uh, 
Then we did a fermentation. As you see, this is lactose consumption. We feed the lactose, which is very, very cheap sugar, and we produce uh, two pure lactose up to one gram per liter. So each fermentation, I was talking to my student, like, you know, if they do a small flask fermentation, it, 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 it has a value of uh, uh, $50,000. If we purify, I mean, we I mean, no, we don't purify. If we purify, if we sell it in the market, and then she did also a fat batch type fermentation to further increase the 12 fat concentration. You know, we feed the sugar, feed the sugar, we've gone, and then we were able to produce the 12 fat up to 4.5 gram per liter. In this case, you know, one big batch will cost to a million dollar. You know, we can make it. So we made this sugar, so now we are trying to purify the sugar and then my colleague is going to use that sugar for uh, doing animal experiment. And the, the goal is if everything looks fine, and if everything works as we imagine, we want to produce 12L and we want to enrich into human infant formula to make a healthy baby. And also another kind of concern, okay, are you making really 12L? So we did the, the mass spec analysis and we found that the fragmentation of this mass spectrum is uh, identical to uh, chemically synthesized 2FL. So it makes sure that we are making 2FL. So in summary, I show you the two examples. Using this metabolic engineering concept, we can produce uh, uh, the fuels and chemical, or we can produce this very uh, high value nutraceutical compound. And I'd like to thank uh, my group members like Sok Jin Ha, who did all the uh, cellulose fermentation study, and also Won Ung Lee, he did the uh, uh, lactose 2FL study. And these are the group members, the, 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 the blue names of who are the person who did all the experiment. And also I'd like to thank my collaborator at UC Berkeley, the Jamie Kate, who provided the uh, cellular bios utilization cassette. And also we had a very uh, close collaboration with the BP scientists. Whenever we develop a new process, whenever we design a new fermentation process, we consult with them to have a more realistic concentration. And also I'd like to thank uh, our funding uh, source, Energy Bioscience Institute. Uh, for your information, this is a, a non-profit bioenergy science institute in this, con uh, in this university and also in UC Berkeley, and which is funded by BP. BP promised to invest $500 million to this uh, institute. So this is the fifth year. They already spent $250 million. Uh, the exactly speaking, they were spent, they pledged to spend $500 million, but only $350 million goes to uh, UIUC and uh, UC Berkeley. $150 goes to BP uh, Research. So they already spent $100, you know, $150 million for bioenergy research, and they will continue to support bioenergy science research. So I'm getting the fund from them. And having said that, I'd like to uh, thank all for your attention. So if you have uh, any question, I would be happy to answer. Um, so very interesting talk. Chat chair? Yes. <clears throat> when you were talking about the co-fermentation, and then the one time you added the, uh, you're changing the uh, substrate, the concentrations. In one of them, you had like a small amount of glucose mm -hmm. alongside the cellular bias. And the, so at what point does that start inhibiting? Or does that, or is there still like a small lag where it'll quickly consume the glucose and then start the rest? Or? So frankly speaking, glucose uh, will be consumed first. Mm -hmm. but because it's so small, it looks like coal. But it, it looks like a coal fermentation. But in reality, glucose will be consumed within a couple of minutes. That amount can be consumed within a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's why, but we had the sampling point after 10 hours, that's why it looks like this, but in reality, glucose is still used first, and cellulose gels will be used later. But since the glucose contamination is not that high, we can disregard the glucose repression. Okay. That explain your question? Okay. Um, I was curious, how is the um, cellulosic material served to the cell Do you homogenize it, or how is it actually delivered? Uh, cellulosic material, so maybe 
So we have powder. So usually we harvest the cell, harvest the plant, and we make the powder, and we do pretreatment, like acid and high temperature treatment, and we get the slurry. Then we add enzyme. Then the slurry become a kind of a sour gel type thing, and we dilute, and we add a medium, and we add the cell, and we do the fermentation. So still it's not that clean. It's like, uh, even at the end of the fermentation, it's like a slurry type. Yeah, but it's very thin slurry at the fermentation. But before the fermentation, it's very thick slurry. Did you answer your question? Um, I have two yeah. questions. So, when you, um, so what's the, um, the current like, cost for making the biofuel with cellulose compared with like gasoline? You mean the cost? To cost. Like how, well, how much is it? I'm not a, like the expert in cost analysis, but if I just give you the ballpark number, uh, I think it's still very expensive to make cellulosic ethanol or cellulosic fuel. Uh -huh. So but what I was told was a kind of an easy way, if the petroleum price, the, 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 what is the petroleum price stay more than $200 per barrel, then we have uh, uh, competitiveness. Okay. Then what I'm saying is making cellulosic fuel makes sense only the price of petroleum is more than $200 per barrel. Right now, it's $100 per barrel, maybe $80. Then, frankly speaking, this doesn't make sense. But they could have space to improve the efficiency. And also, it's not about the money. You know, our winning uh, argument is global climate change. Okay. It's not because of the money. No, the reason why we want to produce biofuel is because of the weather. Not weather, the global climate. Because, uh, you know, by using, you know, more and more petroleum-based uh, resource, we accumulate more and more CO2 in the nature. Uh -huh. But if we do that, even though it is more expensive, it is carbon neutral. Because although the burning of CO2, the ethanol produces CO2, but this CO2 is, uh, will be uh, captured by the plant again. So in general, or in, a nut, you know, in a net cycle, is uh, the, 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 the zero the net zero, the CO2 cycle. Mm -hmm. So it's not all about the money, it's all about the environment, the impact. Okay. Um, another question, I know that even for biofuel production, there are other like alternative approach, like um, for instance, for instance, using algae, mm -hmm. or like the other, like I think, PEMSIL at Harvard, they were kind of re-engineering equalite to converting the solar energy to hydrogen. Right. So all different like, approach for producing biofuel. So can you comment on like the pros and cons of those? Pros okay. The yeah, that's true. So we have a lot of approaches. That's good, because uh, you know we should try a, a lot of things. So this is the uh, conventional process to make a carbon source, or get the sugar and do the fermentation, right? Mm -hmm. And also another approach is uh, let's bypass agriculture. So right now, in order to do so, we need the agriculture. Right? You know, you need to grow the energy crop, corn, whatever. Then you extract the sugar, you do the fermentation. Actually, as a faculty member who is in, I mean, the Agricole College of Agriculture, I like that idea. But there are some people who want to bypass this step, which is um, uh, LG. Right? And LG, there is no agriculture. You have a bioreactor, or you give the sunlight, and then you make the fuel without agriculture. So that's one idea. But what I was told was, it looks good. However, the biggest problem with the uh, microalgae technology is uh, dewatering. Like, after you grow the algae in the water system, your fuel, or well, uh, the product is only inside of the cell. Then you need to separate water from the, the cell. That's very energy intensive, and also the water. Okay. You need a lot of water to do this. So that's why the National Research Council, NRC, uh, uh, made a report last year. They uh, comprehensively review all the process for microalgae, and then their conclusion was uh, water may be a problem. Can they grow, they can grow in seawater, right? Hmm? Seawater, yeah. So that's why they made the major suggestion. If they use the seawater, maybe that would be OK. But the problem is, no, some asymmetry between sunlight and seawater availability. Okay. Wherever we have a strong sunlight, desert, we don't have water, right? Wherever we have a good water availability, like 
some you know, south pole, north pole, we don't have a good sunlight. So some asymmetric is a problem. You know, so if we have a good water in you know, a good uh, the, the sunlight area, that would be great. Excuse me. Excuse me. So that's why the you know, water is a big problem, and then we don't have a good place to have a boat. Okay. And the last one is making like a, a sunlight into hydrogen. That's right. Then hydrogen is also a very interesting approach, you know. But you know, when we are thinking about alternative energy, you know, there are wind energy, solar energy, and many other things. But the reason why we want to do this bioenergy or biofuel production is, if you look at the energy consumption in the United States or in the world, all the energy consumption sector has the same, using the same amount of energy as compared to 10 years ago, except for transportation. We, do, we have enough electricity. We have enough, I mean, we have enough energy for other sector. Only transportation, like a vehicle. We have you know, very rapid uh, increase in the energy consumption. So in order to satisfy the demand, we need to have uh, portable fuel. But electricity is not portable. We have, uh, that's why people are studying the battery. You know, in order to use the battery for the uh, transportation, we need a good battery. So that's the problem. And people are thinking about hydrogen. But as you know, you know, safety issue and things. So that's why hydrogen would be a good idea in the long term. But in you know, a short term, it's uh, very risky to use because of storage problem. You know, the generation of hydrogen is pretty easy. You know, there are many ways to generate cheap hydrogen, but storage and you know, you know, usage is very risky. So that's why you know, if we use biofuel, we can use the existing infrastructure. We don't have to change the car. We don't have to change the gas stage. We don't have to change anything. It's the same liquid fuel. But this uh, electricity or wind energy, solar energy, or hydrogen, then we need to change all the infrastructure. 